Let's talk about renewables for a moment. We've talked about wind and solar. They tend to be gathered in areas that are far from the cities that consume them in large amounts. How do we get wind and solar from the deserts and the plains to the big cities without more transmission lines, which happens to be one of the most controversial issues you can raise in any jurisdiction? That's Governor Whitman? true, and that's one of our biggest challenges because, unfortunately, where the sun tends to shine the most reliably is in the middle of a desert, not near anybody, and where you have the biggest opportunity because wind power requires a big geographic footprint. That tends, again, to be in places where you don't have a lot of people and there's no transmission line there. Our infrastructure, our energy infrastructure, is badly in need of repair no matter what. Even if we didn't add another kilowatt of power, we've got to do something about it because it's really getting to be at the crisis point. But you even talk to environmentalists, and they will tell you that well, we've seen it when there was an attempt to put a wind farm off Nantucket, and it was in some people's view who were big environmentalists, they were able to stop it. Um, I won't name the names, but it's, I think everybody <laughs> knows who they were. They were able to stop it, and they do tend to be in flyways, and birds don't look the same when they come through a windmill on one side as they did going into it. That's not to say we don't, have, we don't need wind power. We do, and we can, and we must. But I think we have to be careful not to get overly enthusiastic about being able to solve all our problems with these. It will be a mix. But transmission, having been a governor during the time when they were trying to site a transmission line of natural gas, NIMBY is alive and well everywhere. And uh, people will fight these things. So again, it doesn't mean you don't do it. And with a national energy policy, it may help us to get some of this done because it may get people to understand that this is not a problem of one community. It's a problem for the entire region, the state and the nation. Jim, NIMBY, 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 let me just tell people, NIMBY not is backyard. not in my backyard. Uh, there's someone else who has offered another version of that, which is banana, yeah. build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I was, I was going to contribute that and, 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 and let everybody know uh, that we just did a review of, of what energy projects have been proposed over the last two years. 244 energy projects have been stopped because of litigation. Uh, and 65 of those were renewable. And so we've got a plague in our country of bananaism, uh, which we really need to get beyond to have any new builds, whether it be renewables or conventional. And, and that really is an important thing that I think we could coalesce around and find a way to move forward, because otherwise we, we can't run a 21st century economy on a 20th century energy infrastructure. Jim, there's a Jim. partial answer here, which is Germany has something called a feed-in tariff. Another 40 countries have followed it. It has, it's, has a strange name because it's a translation from the German. But what it is is a guarantee that individuals and companies will be able to sell up to about 20 megawatts, a small to medium-sized facility worth, of uh, uh, renewable power to uh, uh, utilities for a lengthy period of time, usually 20 years. What that has done is produced a situation where Germany, about a quarter the size of the U.S., has six times the solar of the United States. There's more solar power on one building, a big building, two megawatts in Germany, than in the entire state of Florida or the entire state of Texas. The Germans are doing this right, and they are building small to medium-sized facilities that work, it would in the United States, feed into the distribution grid, which is basically the, the, the wooden poles outside your house. It's not the big steel system, which is the transmission grid. And these are small local facilities on farmers' roofs, that kind of thing. And uh, the Germans have it right. We ought to pay attention. Jim, I think we got to look at both ends of the grid. Uh, one is uh, what we may, maybe we have one agreement here, uh, which is that there really is a need to get high performance trans transmission built and particularly to bring renewables, the wind in the Midwest, solar power in the Southwest to market, to the big cities uh, of our country. Uh, and that's a project that needs capital, uh, it needs financing, uh, and it needs reform so that we have a better planning process to cut through uh, some of the local uh, obstacles to that. We also have to work at the other side of the grid, and that's what Jim was talking about, which is to put uh, smart metering in people's houses, to use the cheapest uh, way that we can reduce uh, our carbon footprint and reduce uh, our dependence on, on uh, fossil fuels is to save the energy, never to use it in the first place. But that's going to require investments in information technology, uh, in smart metering, so that people uh, know how they can lower their price to uh, link that to uh, web-based applications. We've seen that happen at revolution in telecommunications. We can see that happen in energy so that people can 
uh, actually lower the uh, amount that they're using, lower their bills, uh, and lower the dependence on fossil fuels. At the risk of throwing in another thing that might make this even more complicated and controversial, there was a NASA-funded study that's now about eight years old that said over the past 300 years, including the Industrial Revolution, we would have had to have doubled the amount of carbon emitted into the atmosphere to have the same impact on climate change as has been had from land use changes, mm -hmm. from deforestation, from building, and from farming practices. Mm. Now, if we want to talk about, we want a carbon-free economy because for national security, that's one thing. But if part of it is to address the issue of climate change, then we can't get there unless we start to do the kind of thing that really looks at how do we build and where do we build. And I don't think we want, I certainly don't want the federal government to be the national land use planner or my mm -hmm. local authority through whom I have to go to, to make any changes to the house. But we can do a lot better in being a lot smarter on your points about using green building standards, lead building, leadership in energy and environmental design, doing the little things. Purchases of Energy Star products. Energy Star is a program run by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy. And it's purely voluntary, and it benchmarks the energy efficiency of various appliances, everything from a light bulb to a television set, to buildings. Last year removed or prevented the uh, emission of car carbon equivalent to taking 24 million cars off the road. So when people think that I individually can't do anything, you forget that if I do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, all of a sudden we're making a difference. Mm 